with Ryan. Start with Ryan and then move to Louisa and then questions. Does that sound okay? So Ryan, you can take it away. All right. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about uh, pediatric heart failure, obviously uh, trying to get through in uh, 15 minutes. It's a topic that you could either spend, could spend days on, but um, I'll kind of give a little bit of an overview of how we uh, think about it here in Dallas and kind of uh, rather than folk on um, sort of in specific devices or specific things, kind of a little bit more of just the, the gestalt kind of, a, of, of the approach that we take. Um, so a little bit of background um, is always good. Um, heart failure is a common problem in adults. In the US, for example, there are about 6 million people with uh, heart failure and somewhere around 300,000 deaths. And it's pretty common in adults, but much less common in children. So um, in children, there's a little bit less uh, information, different causes and mechanisms than in adults, um, but probably on the order of 12,000 to 35,000 children in the US each year. So obviously it's a, it's a much smaller problem in children than in adults. And um, in some ways kind of harder too, just because there's a lot of diverse reasons that kids get heart failure. Um, there's certainly acute heart failure episodes after cardiac surgery um, can happen, post-cardiotomy syndrome. Um, and then myocarditis, which obviously many po folks have gotten much more familiar with in the, in the era of COVID, um, coronary ischemia, pulmonary hypertension, and then um, chronic heart failures like cardiomyopathies, and then many patients with congenital heart disease. And um, even among these chronic heart failures, sometimes uh, patients will present with acute uh, um, exacerbations. And so one of the challenges, I think, you know, adults, sorry, the... Um, the presentation of adults with heart failure is sort of, uh, I guess what we might call typical. They often have chest pain, really often have dyspnea, things that we sort of know about and recognize pretty quickly as heart failure. Um, I think it's much more challenging to recognize heart failure in kids, which is one of the reasons that often they end up presenting pretty late to medical care. So this was uh, one study that showed that 90% of, of kids with adult acute heart failure um, actually have, um, uh, GI uh, present really with primarily gastrointestinal symptoms into the emergency department. So um, a little bit more difficult to identify. And then um, if you look specifically at myocarditis uh, patients, and again, uh, something we're becoming more familiar with diagnosing the era of COVID, but um, about half of those children will present with um, initially with being diagnosed with these, either asthma or pneumonia at their initial evaluation. And so I think diagnosis is hard in, in pediatrics. It's really hard to find the kids with heart failure and diagnose them quickly. And so often um, that means that diagnosis occurs late. Um, and it's sort of like finding a needle in a haystack. And um, as a the surgeon, I have the the uh, advantage of being the one who gets to take care of them after they've already been identified as the needle in the haystack. And it's more the emergency department and pediatricians who um, struggle with this picture of trying to find that one kid with heart failure in the midst of all the other kids who have GI symptoms and asthma and pneumonia. Um, and so it can be challenging to, to get to that, to that one kid. But when they do come in and, and we work them up, um, I think this is... Um, you know, as kids come in with acute uh, decompensated heart failure, um, what we've sort of worked on, um, and it's derived from a lot of other, uh, other work too, is uh, coming up with a protocol for how to approach kids who come into our institution with acute decompensated heart failure. And this is our um, rapid action plan protocol. Um, and I'm going to highlight a couple things because I think it's sort of a, a an, uh, not necessarily easy, heart failure is never easy, but it's it simplifies the thought process around managing these kids and, and tries to think about how to take care of them in the most effective way possible. So the first uh, sort of pathway is, you know, someone comes in with to our emergency department or into the hospital with acute decompensated heart failure. And the sort of first question that we ask is, do they really have impending cardiac or respiratory failure? Um, apropos to the title of the talk about uh, team, you know, a team approach, I think the one of the critical parts is that the first thing in our um, in our sort of protocol of how to manage these patients is communication, and so making sure that all of the people who may be able to help uh, with such a patient are um, aware that the patient's there and can 
um, and can be available and can help with developing a plan that's going to be um, the most uh, the the best treatment for for this child. And so uh, for us, that involves you know notifying the cardiac surgeon, notifying our cardiac anesthesiologist, notifying the heart failure attending, and notifying the ECMO team, so that everyone's available and on board. Um, in someone who is acutely ill and may uh, have uh, have very rapid decompensation. And then you can see we sort of move towards um, interventions. You know, initially, obviously, we want to get labs and type and screen and, and, and prepare for ECMO if we need to. Um, initially, starting with um, epinephrine as the first, uh, first choice in someone who we think is uh, potentially going to have our emergent cardiac or impending cardiac or respiratory failure, and then, you know, potentially adding milrinone if patients are normotensive and seem like they might be able to tolerate it. Um, certainly uh, fluid management, um, respiratory management, um, innovation can often be a, a treatment for, uh, for acute heart failure by unloading the left ventricle, um, although uh, innovation itself certainly carries risks. And I think um, you know, as you can see at the bottom here, avoid sedation unless needed for procedures. Um, that's again, where that communication part is important. So, you know, developing a plan with everyone involved, having the most expert person do each procedure to try to uh, help someone who's acutely ill. Um, so that's sort of the, the really, the really, really sick patients who come in. The other side is our, if, if the answer to the no, uh, to the impending cardiac or respiratory failure is no, um, we, we kind of work through this um, initial classification. And again, this isn't something we came up with. It's sort of a, a wider, uh, uh, more widely used throughout heart failure. But I always find it um, as a surgeon, I think simplifying things is always good. Um, we don't like to make things too complicated. And so um, I think this provides a really um, sort of uh, reproducible and straightforward way of classifying children who come in in heart failure. It's derived from adult data, but um, really it, it sort of just classifies people into these four boxes based on whether they're warm or cold and whether they're dry or wet. And, and I think it really helps with the subsequent management of patients. Um, uh, warm or cold tells you how they're, how they're perfused. Do they have enough blood? Do they have enough blood traveling to their, um, you know, enough cardiac output that they're actually delivering blood, warm blood to their periphery and maintaining a, a warm temperature. And then wet versus dry tells you whether or not they're congested. It's, it's sort of a, a gross way of measuring whether they've got too much um, fluid on board or, 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 um, or not enough or, or an adequate amount. And so when we um, move to these, you know, once you've identified which group they fall into, um, it really helps you with the subsequent management. Um, so patients who are cold and, and wet, and these are certainly um, concerning, you know, patients because they're cold, so they don't have great perfusion, um, and they're um, and they're very congested. Um, in these patients, you know, we want to try to get their perfusion a little bit better, so either milrinone or epinephrine is helpful, and then. Um, we certainly want to try to get them decongested if possible. Um, and, and this is one of the things I think that this uh, algorithm is helpful is thinking about holding chronic uh, medica medications or not holding them. So in patients who have poor perfusion, we generally want to hold their chronic heart medications until we sort of see how they're doing. Um, cold and dry, which is um, again, poor perfusion, but not really very congested. Um, in these patients, really, the, we want to work on um, improving their cardiac output. And and then the group that's uh, warm and wet, they're congested, but they have good perfusion. These are ones where um, we, we generally want to continue their chronic heart failure medications. And again, we want to get them diuresed and, and start getting fluid off. And so I think um, obviously each patient's individual and all of this stuff um, becomes more specific when you have a patient in front of you. But um, I think that general um, classification into kind of four groups is very helpful. Um, Moving a little bit, and again, I'm a surgeon, so I'm going to move on to surgical stuff uh, too. But um, you know, thinking about medical therapy, these are sort of all of the medical therapies um, that we use. Most of them are really based on expert consensus and extrapolation of adult data rather than large trials in children, which really goes back to that uh, first few slides, um, you know, showing that that the problem of heart failure is less common in children. Um, but um, extrapolating from those uh, from data in adults. Um, you know, often we treat um, uh, we treat with similar medications, ACE inhibition, 
um, diuretics, uh, spironolactone and beta blockade to try to improve um, cardiac remodeling and, um, and counteract the sort of negative feedback cycles that occur in the setting of heart failure. Um, and so as we move through um, the, you know, the, the surgical um, uh, strategy is, uh, has historically been sort of focused on transplant. And I think um, having trained at Columbia, I always have to put up that they did the first pediatric heart transplant, which is probably not actually true, but everyone, you know, likes to believe their own institution did the first of something. But um, among the first transplants in children was, uh, was done at Columbia in, in 1984. And, and transplantation has been a great success for a lot of these kids when uh, those medical therapies fail to, to provide effective remodeling. Um, uh, but uh, there are downsides to it. One is that the median survival, you know, um, this is a little bit older slide, is uh, between 15 and 20 years, I would say now, depending a little bit on the age um, of the recipient. Um, so median graft sur survival is pretty good, but it's not for, um, and, um, and weightless mortality, and this is data from the US, is, uh, is pretty high still. So between 15 and 20% um, in children on the, on the uh, wait list, much higher than uh, most of the other organs except for lungs. But I think the critical part here is that these are patients who are listed for transplantation. And there's a lot of patients who are never get listed for transplantation because they're too sick. Um, or they die before they arrive at a transplant center. They have comorbidities, whether that's recent cancer or something else. They may have other contraindications. And then probably the biggest thing, and especially for an audience uh, outside the US, um, is access to transplantation. So um, out, outside the US, certainly um, overall access is harder. Access to donors in, um, in Europe is much harder. And so um, there's, uh, although patients once listed don't have terrific outcomes and there are challenges with transplantation itself afterwards, um, just getting access to transplantation as a therapy um, is challenging. And so um, this was uh, a, a quote, um, it's partially from um, the original ventricular assist device uh, trial um, that, you know, for the individual patient, heart transplantation is a miracle, but from an epidemiological perspective, it's largely insignificant. And that partly comes from, from that idea that, um, you know, when I started the slide, I said there were, um, you know, several millions of people just in the U.S. with heart failure. And even in the U.S., there are somewhere on the order of several thousand heart transplants, uh, a couple thousand performed every year. That's, you know, insignificant compared to the larger burden of patients with heart failure. And that uh, only worsens as you move um, outside of the U.S. And so, you know, how do we uh, work uh, to get kids with medically refractory heart failure to survive um, either to transplantation um, in the case of patients who are able to get access and are able to get listed, but also how can we get them to survive without transplantation? And I think that's one of the, the, um, the sort of uh, the great success stories, although I think we're still largely in the middle of it, of, of pediatric heart failure care over the last five to 10 years has been sort of the increasing um, ability to treat children with mechanical circulatory support and to help them get to this point where they can um, survive to or without transplantation. So, you know, we, always, we think of surviving to transplantation, we're using the device as a bridge to transplantation. Without transplantation, we can think of it as either destination therapy or, or bridge to recovery. Um, both of which are, uh, are, are useful strategies. Um, and, and ultimately, I think though, you know, whatever the um, ultimate goal, what we tend to think of is mechanical circulatory support is really a way of uh, continuing to support children when medical therapy hasn't been effective. And, you know, defining exactly what the, the goal is in a, in a specific way isn't always necessary but really trying to think about how are we helping each child in front of us um, to, to live longer or better and, and how is the devices that we have available going to do that and, and assist them. Um, and, and the indication for us in initiating mechanical circulatory support is really in a broad sense is failure or insufficiency of another organ system happening due to inadequate cardiac function despite medical therapy. And so the kinds of things we look for kids who are on mechanical ventilation 
renal failure, liver failure, altered mental status, ind indicating poor uh, cerebral perfusion. And we use echoes and occasionally cardiac casts to show that they have bad cardiac function and that the, the, uh, improving their cardiac output is going to help them. Um, this is sort of a summary slide. And this is where, you know, it's uh, certainly in a 15 minute talk, I, I'm not gonna be able to kind of go through every option that's available. And obviously those options vary based on center and the country you're in and, and where, you know, what you have at your disposal. Um, but sort of broadly, these are the kind, these are the devices that we have available at, you know, in various forms and various ways at, at different centers. And, you know, it starts with sort of the old standby of pediatric uh, heart failure um, care of ECMO, and then moves through transcatheter VADs, paracorporeal VADs like the Berlin Heart, um, intracorporeal VADs um, generally designed for adults like the HeartMate 3 currently, and then the total artificial heart. And but really, um, as we approach each of these, and, and obviously, um, which ones you choose will depend on which ones you have available, but um, in the, within whichever ones you have available, really, these are the sorts of things that, um, that we consider in trying to identify what the optimal way to support any uh, individual is. And so um, certainly the acuity of support is important. You know, ECMO is extremely fast to put on, um, you know, as long as you um, have the, the pump available and a team available, it's easy to, to get it in there. Um, in contrast, putting a total artificial heart in someone is a long process that requires a bypass machine and, and a long operation. Um, we try to think about how long we, we might want to support someone. ECMO is great for short periods of time, but um, not really very good for more than a few weeks. Um, pulmonary status is critical because ECMO is the only one of these with, that will help with uh, one's lungs. And so someone who has lung disease, whether secondary to their heart failure or independent of their heart failure, um, will often need that oxygenator to help them get through it. And then um, patient age and size and anatomy certainly play a, a role as we really think about trying to support kids. Um, size, uh, age and size have a lot to do with what devices are available. And then anatomy, um, very much plays into our ability to support children. And often is actually where ECMO becomes um, important when you're thinking about someone who has complex congenital anatomy and, and may not be, uh, be able just from an anatomic perspective to be supported without that oxygenator. Um, in terms of sort of timelines for support, um, you know, ECMO again is, is great for days um, and, and maybe up to weeks, but it certainly falls off after that. Um, transcatheter VADs where they're available, like the Impella or, um, or the ProTech, um, are um, newer technology, but can be very useful for on a similar time scale. And then as we move to sort of the paracorporeal and intracorporeal VADs, those are, you know, um, can support kids for months and, and even years. Um, as an example, we have a, a Glenn right now who's been um, in, in the hospital, unfortunately, because she has a paracorporeal VAD that she can't go home with but with a continuous flow paracorporeal VAD and has been um, on it for 500 and I think 50 days right now and ambulates and um, other than being stuck in the hospital um, does well. So these can support children for a very long time. Uh, certainly intracorporeal VADs uh, designed for adults are where the longest time support is. Um, in all of these cases, like I mentioned, I think the whether you need an oxygenator or not is, is sort of a, a central determinant of whether we can use one of these other devices rather than using ECMO. Uh, but where you don't need an oxygenator, um, I think uh, avoiding it is critical um, because, oops, sorry, the, uh, because the um, outcomes, and this is from the Berlin Heart Trial um, and compared to a, a group of children supported with uh, ECMO, uh, no one survived more than 21 days um, on ECMO to a heart transplant. And in contrast, the, the survival on the Berlin heart, while not perfect, was certainly much better than that. So, you know, if you need an oxygenator, then you need an oxygenator and ECMO is the right uh, therapy. But if you don't, it's much better to try to figure out a, a methodology of support without it. And then um, after you move through that sort of decision point, really, you know, what size is the patient and what pumps will fit is a really big determinant of what uh, mechanical support we can offer. Um, in Dallas, we are um, uh, 
have the, the luxury of having a lot of devices available. And this is uh, the range of devices we have, uh, including ECMO on the, on the left, but um, Impella transcatheter VAD. Um, this is a continuous flow VAD that we use frequently. Um, we're in a trial of new pediatric continuous flow VAD, the Jarvik 2015. We do have the Berlin Heart available. And we have the HeartMate 3 um, in, in adults. And, you know, um, it's sort of easy. I think often um, uh, we do get spoiled by having all of these devices available. But I think as you, um, in each center, as you figure out what devices you have available, um, along with uh, your team, you can figure out what types of support you can offer. And often one of these devices, even though it may not be quite as good as a device specifically designed for a specific application, can be um, used in a wide range of support. Um, and so as an example, the, the continuous flow Centromag that we have can be used sort of for everything from ECMO through, like I said, someone who's been on, in, on support for 500 days. So I think there are options and, um, and uh, especially trying to move away from ECMO and think about how to use the devices that we have um, in the optimal way uh, that we can is, is sort of the, the best uh, approach. Um, this is again, kind of our experience with, um, with all of these devices over the last 10 years. And, and you can see again, it's a huge number of devices that we've used over the last 10 years. Um, but I think the, the sort of critical things are that we've gotten enough experience in each of these devices to use, to use them effectively. And that's where I think um, at smaller centers or centers with less frequent presentation with kids and heart failure, really thinking about um, how to take uh, devices that you have um, and work them into sort of a wider range, but get very familiar with them is critical. Um, it's part of the reason that we've uh, really focused on in our children in, in using continuous flow devices like the Centromag and PDMag um, rather than the Berlin Heart as commonly. And that's partly because it allows us to use continuous flow support across the entire spectrum of ages and size. And um, in doing that, we really have the same physiology and, and that includes ECMO, which is a continuous flow device with an oxygenator all the way through the HeartMate 3, which is a continuous device you can go home on. The physiology ends up being the same. And so trying to um, plan how to, uh, how to approach device selection and device um, uh, use to make it sort of as simple as possible, um, but allow you to support the widest range of patients as possible. And um, ultimately the goal is really to have, uh, try to be flexible in the way that we support kids and to try to um, look at each child and figure out um, what the right um, type of support is to, to minimize the complications maximize their likelihood of recovery and ideally recovery, but also, you know, whether um, maximize their likelihood of getting to a transplant, if that's an option, and in the long run, really improve their survival. And the way we think about all these things, whether it's transplant or devices or medical therapy is as a spectrum of options um, that we can offer, rather than um, someone comes in heart failure, and we're trying to get them to a transplant. Um, I think the goal is to really think about for every child, uh, the goal is to help them live longer and live better. And within the armamentarium of what we have, whether that's medical therapies, uh, chronic heart failure medications, whether it's devices um, or transplant, um, being able to um, figure out for each child what the best way to help them live um, a long and better life as much as possible is, is our goal. Um, and so hopefully I've stayed close to 15 minutes to, to give Louise time for her portion. Um, but uh, in conclusion, heart failure is uh, definitely challenging to recognize in children. Um, management of acute decompensation, really, I think it's critical to involve the whole team early. We all have different areas of expertise. We have different specialties um, and really bringing that all to bear to, uh, on one child who's acutely ill, I think is the way to get them to have the best outcome. Um, there's a lot of devices available. The optimal device depends on a lot of factors, um, you know, patient factors like size, the duration of support, need for an oxygenator, but also on the devices that any particular center has available. Um, a, a device may be perfect, but if you don't have it on your shelf, it's not the right one. 
So I think trying to figure out um, what uh, each center can offer and how to use those offerings in the best way possible is important. Um, early evaluation and implant is often the key to survival, to doing well with VADs, waiting for people to get too sick um, before initiating support is, uh, is not often good. Overall, um, you know, survival with VADs has been improving steadily in pediatrics as centers have become more experienced and, and also as centers have become better at sharing their knowledge, um, both uh, virtually and in person um, to really improve everyone's outcomes. And those outcomes are definitely better, um, better than on ECMO. And then, um, you know, really thinking about how to develop a plan that's institution specific for everyone's institution that takes into account what devices we have available at any institution, what the goals of therapy, uh, duration of support, and really thinking a lot about simplifying it and how to make um, the, the institution, both the, the clinical institution of support, um, medical support, and then mechanical support uh, as simple as possible, um, but also trying to think about how to simplify the, the devices that we have to make it easier for the whole team to manage those devices, I think is critical. And in the end, you know, this again is really the way we approach heart failure, which is, you know, with what we have available, how can we best provide this child with a longer and better life? And, and for some kids um, that may be uh, a durable ventricular assist device that they can go home with. Um, and for some kids, it may be a transplant. And for some kids, it's, a, you know, a temporary device that gets them to recover and go home without anything or a temporary device that moves into something else. So, you know, really thinking, I think the, the critical part is uh, individualizing this to the child in front of you and to the um, institution's uh, resources so that um, you can try to help each child as best you can. So that was, that was a very quick uh, overview of, of heart failure. And hopefully, um, I'm also obviously happy to answer questions after Lisa talks, but um, hopefully that was helpful. Thanks, Ryan. That was great. That was perfect. And um, I encourage people, if you have questions, put them in the chat, like I'm putting my questions in the chat, just like I remember we can review them when um, we come to the question and answer portion of the presentation. But I'd like to go on to Louisa and see her take on the management of heart failure and team approach. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Hi, yes, we can hear Hi, you. Hi, how are you? Hi. Right, let me share my screen. Right, thank you. Let me go ahead and start this. I hope my subtitles work in Spanish. I tried. And they do, but they are in English. Great. Okay. I apologize for that. I oh, no. tried really hard to make them into Spanish. I lost them and now I gained them, but now they're in English. So, so much for that. Um, so my name is Lisa Angel. I'm one of the nurse practitioners over in the cardiac ICU at Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami. And first of all, thank you very much to HeartCare International for uh, allowing me this time and inviting me to be a part of this really fabulous educational uh, forum that you guys have provided for everybody. So thank you very much. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on heart uh, failure a little bit more towards nursing that is kind of my and what I feel. Lisa, your your we can't hear you well. In uh, of managing the value. Um, Louisa, I think we just lost her. Right. Um, Let me text her. Would you text her? And maybe we can do some questions Hello? with Ryan. Hi, can you? Yeah, why don't we do some questions with Ryan, Betsy, and you text Louisa? How's that? Okay, okay. Sounds okay, good. Okay, great. So um, this question from the audience. If, so if you have a child in heart failure, class four, so that we'll call it the acutely decompensated heart failure, a dotted cardiomyopathy, hypersensitized, which is a little bit unusual, but hypersensitized, which would you offer? 
ventricular assist device, a destination therapy, or a transplant with a positive crossmatch? That is it's certainly a challenging question. I think um, our, depending a little bit on the senses, on the specifics of the sensitization, our experience um, with desensitizing kids, especially with, with like 100% class one, is, has been pretty poor. Um, so we've tended to, to be moving a little bit away from transplanting patients with a, cross to, with a positive cross match. Um, I think um, in older patients where uh, you can get a durable device in, um, that's probably, you know, that would be where we would lean. I think it is uh, a very challenging thing in smaller kids who don't have a durable device option um, where you would, would head. I, I think the sort of um, the other challenge with, you know, with uh, acute presentations is always um, to what extent is the sensitization chronic versus um, acute and whether it will go away. We've certainly had kids who went on ECMO who were highly sensitized, but it turns out once we got far away from the ECMO and put a device in and got them better, their sensitization went away. On the other hand, we've had kids who it turned out were chronically sensitized um, and we were wrong about that and ended up on a, a temporary device and weren't big enough for um, for conversion to a durable device and, and discharge and weren't eligible for a transplant. So I, the short, the sort of, that's a long answer to say it's a really tough question. I think it depends a lot on the specifics of the cross match um, and the size of the patient. And and again, that's where, you know, being able to um, customize, sort of customize the answer to the exact patient is important because if you have an option to get someone home on a durable adult device, that can be a terrific option for people. So um, I think that's sort of, um, uh, you know, in contrast, if you've got a two-year-old who's in the exact same situation, you may, you know, that's where a transplant with a positive cross match is probably going to be your better strategy. And really sort of looking at the risks and benefits for that child, right? Correct. Yeah. And, you know, really thinking about the individualized risks and benefits as best you can um, to give them the best option. And there are some desensitization protocols that are, are used pre-transplant that the effectiveness is a little hard to know because sometimes it's clearing the antibodies, but not the cells that produce the antibodies. So it's not really getting rid of memory cells. And there's also strategies at the time of transplant. Um, several of the centers who participated in the in the NIH study looking at sensitization, we did plasmapheresis at the time of transplant and then treated with um, rituximab and IVIG so that you try to clear them. And it actually was fairly effective even in patients with positive cross match. So, so you have to weigh what you think the risks are of the patient not surviving without the transplant is really kind of how you think about it. Yeah. Um, so I see Louise is back. Sorry about that. We're having a bit of a storm around here, so my, oh, no. my internet must have completely <laughs> gone out. I apologize for that. Shall we try it again? By, by all means, let's do this and see if Please, we can get Please, yes. This. All right. So, as I was saying before the storm cut me out, uh, I'm going to take a bit of approach of like from a nursing perspective. So I'm going to start at the beginning. Oh, look, my subtitles in Spanish came back. Yay. Um, <laughs> so uh, really, what is heart failure? I think, again, I'm going to take it from the very beginning and very basic. Really, it's just a heart oh, no. ability to meet uh, the metabolic demands, demands that we have. Oh boy. You know, Betsy, it might work if she called in and yeah, let me let me tell her. And then yeah. uh, she could slow show her slides, but we probably hear the audio better. Right. So maybe we should just try the call in number. Um or our, our too much demands or our bodies. Hi Louisa. We're having trouble. Do you guys not hear me? Yes, we're wondering if you could call in, if you could use a cell phone or something to call in to the call in number. So we'll, you'll probably keep your audio better if you were calling on a regular line. Um, so let's go back to Ryan since you're still here, Ryan. <laughs> we can hear you. Sure. Um, so uh, Carlos is asking about the transport of critical patients with CHF. I guess is that you mean? 
uh, Carlos, I guess you're on the phone, so you could, uh, you're, I can see you're there. Is it about transporting patients into your center? Um, is yes. Transporting patients? So, so what do you do? Yes, to, okay. How do you, how do you transport safely when you have a call? Um, that, uh, I think that it does depend a lot on what resources you have available. We do have um, the ability to transport on ECMO, which um, not every center does, but um, being in Texas where uh, there are long distances between, um, between locations, um, we are able to transport um, both by helicopter and fixed wing if we need to, um, but certainly by land um, on ECMO. Um, we can also transport patients on VADs. That depends a lot on the type of VAD they're on. Um, the, um, the Berlin Heart, for example, the, the driver weighs about 350 pounds. So that is not straightforward to transport anywhere. Um, I think, you know, as patients are on um, other devices, particularly dischargeable devices, it becomes much easier. Um, although certainly there's a lot of training. And when we have kids who discharge on durable devices, um, we do training with local EMS and fire departments to get them um, to understand sort of how to take care of the bed and how to help transport patients in. Um, the other side, um, you know, in patients who aren't on support yet, for, but are in acute heart failure, um, a lot of that is just us trying to get them to your center as quickly as possible and whatever way that you can get them as quickly as possible, um, I think is often the best way. Um, we, you know, we usually have critical care transport teams that are medical supervised, but nursing nurses on the actual transport team. And I think that works very well, um, but certainly trying to get uh, children to a place where they have all the options uh, as soon as possible is probably the best thing. Uh, and Ryan, I think your point about how to uh, manage sedation and intubation with these patients is an important one. They are very, very unstable. So that you might say, oh, I'd like to quote, stabilize them on the transport. I'd like to intubate them or put lines in and really have total control. But in that situation, it is very, um, very much, at least less you do, the better until you get to a place that can take care for them. Hi. Uh, what number can you really call? do see people? Um, we do really do see people decompensate because, uh, quickly. Yeah, because I don't see so, um, in the in that yeah. flyer. I don't see a number. I think that's a great point, and having um, being able to have that discussion, even if it's yeah. someone at a distance with yeah. the anesthesiologist and with the team at the receiving facility to or figure out the best way to transport the them, I think with, is critical. Send them to Daphne, and Daphne will. Hey, Betsy, can you meet yourself? Sorry. <laughs> right, so I think we're working on Louise's talk. So I did actually have a question. You know, Brian, you showed, I was, I was very interested in your idea of getting experience at a center with the devices that are the most broadly be able to use because you're in, in, in places that can have 10 devices or five devices, it really is important that the team become an, comfortable with the device they have or the devices they have. So if you try to compare the costs and the personnel training amongst your, you know, your Centromag versus the Berlin versus the Jarvik, what would you say? It seems like you're leaning toward the Centromag, but how, how would you think about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do tend to lean towards the Centromag in terms for, for a few reasons. One is that um, training, it's a pretty easy device to work with. Um, it's certainly easier. I think the Berlin takes, um, there's a lot of tweaking sort of, it, it takes a lot of experience to understand how to manage a Berlin safely. Um, I think uh, the Centromag also does have, and, and I'm using Centromag because that's what we have, but other continuous flow pumps are probably not all that different um, rota flows and, and other similar pumps. Um, they have the ability to also be used for ECMO so they can be easily moved back and forth. We just had a kid who is on a PD mag and a neonate um, who we added an oxygenator to for five days and then took it out again. So I think that gives you a lot of flexibility. It can be used, the same um, console can be used from a two kilo kid all the way up to a hundred kilo kid with slight changes in the actual pump. The center mag itself, um, and I'm, you know, I forget what the controller cost is. The disposables I believe are about Ten thousand dollars. They're not cheap. Um, the for each support, but you know, you contrast that with the HeartMate three, which is in the hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollar range um, for the implant. I think um, 
there's obviously a big range um, and obviously it'll vary depending on your institution and all sorts of contracts, but, um, uh, and there are cheaper, ver cheaper uh, continuous flow pumps than the Centromag itself. But I think um, thinking about what you can have available and really thinking about how, um, how broadly you can use it. And so I do tend to, to think that both because it's relatively easy to learn and because it can be broadly applied, a continuous flow pump, whether it's Centromag or the Rotaflow is often sort of the easiest thing to, um, to, to use. And, and it's easy to implant with standard bypass cannulas. And, you know, we tend to use Berlin heart cannulas, but again, those become more expensive and, you know, access can be hard. So I think the advantage of those continuous flow pumps is they're broadly applicable, can be used with relatively off the shelf um, equipment a lot of the time. And the training, which is probably the sort of the most important part is very straightforward. You get to a lot of these more complex pumps and trying to learn a new pump in the console and how that works. It can be a lot to train someone on. Um, whereas becoming very familiar with one pump that can be used for everything from ECMO to supporting a, a 100 kilo, you know, adolescent, I think is valid. Okay, thank you. So um, I think we're gonna try again, uh, Betsy, I, I, Luz, I didn't get your slides. So perhaps you wanna try sharing your screen and speaking right now, let me send, if I get the slides, we'll try it again. Okay, great. Now um, you seem to be on mute. So should we, is she on the phone, Betsy? We can't quite hear you. We can't hear you. How about if I put it on my, oh, here we go. Okay. So Lisa, I don't know why we can't hear you on the phone. You she dialed in, right? You you dialed in on the phone number, right? No, the problem is is that this is the Montefiore on dialing, and they didn't give us an app. They didn't give us a number. Oh, we didn't give you an international one. No, we don't have a number because this is not the heart care link. This is the um, heart. Um, sure, sure, sure. Oh, yeah. But I think if I can. If you can't hear me and she calls me, I can add her. You know what I mean? And then maybe uh -huh. this way? I hear something. Somebody say, ah. Uh -huh. That was me. So um, do you have, uh, why, don't she, why don't she call you on your phone, Betsy? You put your phone yeah. next to your, your right. mic. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hold hey. on. Can you can you hear her? Yes, we can. Everyone. Okay, so let's do it that way. Let's do the old-fashioned way. You present your slides, and now I have you on my phone. Perfect. All right. Let's see if I can share the slides like this. Yes. Yes. That's great. Let's try this, Louisa. Fantastic. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll breeze through some of the beginning slides since we've eaten up some of the time. Uh, but really, uh, heart failure can be, out of this one, I would like to just maybe say heart failure can be acute chronic or acute on chronic. And really, the management of either one is very different, as Dr. Davis was mentioning before, because you can present a kid that has already a long-standing history of heart failure, but it's no longer compensating. So when that moment arises, then you have to go into rescue mode as opposed to maintenance mode. So it's just something to keep in mind from a nursing standpoint when you're getting a patient in the hospital, what kind of heart failure that patient is in, or because that will determine your actions and your preventive um, 
measures that you're going to take. Causes of heart failure, remember we can have a structurally normal heart. Uh, prenatally, it can be anything like a, a, anemias, arrhythmias, neonates in infants, more again, anemias, but it can also be from hypoxic ischemic injuries, infections, sepsis, dilated cardiomyopathies. So it's, we tend to think of heart failure as mostly a congenital heart disease induced problem, but there are other, many other disease processes that can lead to heart failure. In childhood, acquired valve disorders, cardiomyopathies, acquired cardiomyopathies, hypertension, renal failure. All of those are, are things, disease processes that are not necessarily cardio, uh, cardiology in nature, but will land you into, uh, land you into heart failure. Uh, in congenital heart disease, it's important to keep the diagnosis that could potentially give you heart failure uh, in the back of your mind, just again for um, anticipatory guidance prenatally. A lot of times it's AV valve regurgitation, mitral stenosis, a patient that may be in heart block, um, although that's not necessarily congenital heart disease, but yeah, yeah, a patient that's in heart block um, that could even have developed a, a certain degree of high drops in utero, and then it's a patient that's going to be born very, very sick. In neonates and infants, when you have a systemic outflow obstruction, you're going to have something like quartation or an aortic valve stenosis. When you have a systemic inflow obstruction, uh, you can have mitral stenosis or pulmonary valve stenosis. And then a systemic ventricular volume overload. Uh, things like uh, BSDs, PDAs, and single ventricles, especially in the interstage uh, area between a Norwood and a Glen. When you have a patient that has too big of a shunt and maybe overcirculated, uh, so you're normally thinking that this patient may have uh, cyanosis issues or um, shunt issues, but heart failure is also a common problem with these patients. And then in childhood, aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis, and pulmonary valve stenosis. Now, as to the clinical presentation in infancy, these are babies that are going to have feeding difficulties, that are going to be tachypnic, that this is the baby that the parent is going to tell you he breathes a mile a minute and every I'm having to change his clothes on a regular basis because he's always wet. It's a baby that's not going to gain weight because, again, it has very high metabolic demands and it's probably not eating enough to meet those metabolic demands may have poor peripheral perfusion, cardiomegaly and pulmonary vascular venous congestion and x-ray like the one you see right there. So those are all things that may start you thinking about heart failure, but may not. But those are all things that we need to think about when we start getting that history from the parent. In terms of childhood, the presentation might be a little bit different because this may be a child that has developed slowly heart failure symptoms over time, and now it may just be getting to that point where they can no longer compensate. You may have a child that presents with shortness of breath, inability to um, keep up with his peers, inability to play along with his peers, a chronic hacking cough, orthopnea, exercise intolerance. This is a baby or a child that might be eating okay, but still look cachectic, still look wasted, still look undernourished, even though the parents may be telling you, well, he's a picky eater, but he eats enough, but is he really eating enough? On exam, you'll find some hepatomegaly, edema, if the, if the heart failure has progressed enough. And this may be an edema that the parents may not notice right away because it has developed very slowly. So they may just seem a little bit plump, and but somebody that hasn't seen the child um, for a while might notice more evidently. And then again, on x-ray, you might find cardiomegaly. Now, what are some of the interventions that are very important from a nursing standpoint to take, uh, to take into consideration or to pay close attention when you're taking care of a patient in heart failure? First of all, I think everybody will agree, close monitoring of fluid balance. And I cannot stress this enough. This is a baby or a patient that we're going to want to have very, very tight controls of eyes and nose. Uh, Blood pressure monitoring is both arterial and venous. If you have any sort of central line catheters, obviously keep track of what those blood pressures are. You may have elevated central venous pressures if the, if the patient is developing heart failure symptoms. Um, if you're having IV or enteral fluids, there may be a difference of how tolerant you are or uh, to being positive in your eyes and nose balance. And also you may have a, you may be a little bit more liberal in how much fluid you give this patient or 
less aggressive with your diuretic therapy. Enteral fluids are just digested differently than IV fluids, so we tend to have a much tighter control of IV fluids. Then you have fluid restrictions. Um, you have feeding protocols um, in terms of limiting the feeding time, alternating the feeding routes, and optimizing caloric intake in order to be able to track your weight appropriately. In terms of nursing intervention while, while the patient is hospitalized, this is a patient that's going to have lots of poly, polypharmacy. It's a patient that's going to be on lots of medications, in, which will include easily diuretics, such as uh, furosemide, hydrochloric thiazide, spironolactone, vasodilators in case you need to bring down your blood pressure and relieve some of the, of the workload of the heart, beta blockers, digoxin, all of those are uh, can usually done enterally, and so we need to train the parents on how to do this when they go home. And then if the patient is just sick enough, obviously we're going to go into IV medications such as norinone, epinephrine, and, do uh, and dopamine. This is obviously, I did not even include uh, all the care that goes into once the patient is on any sort of advanced life support, uh, such as ECMO or such as, um, you know, an artificial VAD, that, in which case then we're talking about a whole different um, skill set and a whole different um, care of that patient, which I just didn't feel like we had enough time to go into in, in depth in this come in this talk due to the time restraints. Now, when we're talking about sending this patient home, it's very important as, as a nurse to involve as many multidisciplinary. Uh, elements, because this is a patient that's going to need very, very chronic care through the lifespan. It should be multidisciplinary. It should involve physical and occupational therapy, if at all possible. And if those services are not available in the community or are not available to the patient, then we definitely need to teach the parents how to promote mobility, how to promote the patient being independent, how to promote normalcy. Sometimes this, the babies are admitted for a long time in the hospitals. Like Dr. Davis was mentioning, if it's a patient that's on an artificial heart or any sort of artificial uh, assist device that cannot go home, how can we bring the school to the hospital, keep their mobility as much as possible within the, the restrictions of activity of the patient? Dietary restrictions. Is, are we going to have to restrict a child from eating pizza and burgers and french fries? Well, most likely we are because those are high sodium and we may not need a patient with high sodium diet intake. So trying to help the parents find healthy alternatives, trying to find this uh, make things as normal as possible, but also reiterate to them and to the child or the teenager the importance of, of sticking to this diet, the importance of sticking to, you know, being adhering to this treatment as much as possible in order to promote the, uh, the best long-term outcomes. And then managing long-term expectations. I think that if we see that it's a baby, depending on the diagnosis and what the cause of the heart failure is, we may have hopes of reversing those heart failure symptoms. But if it's something like a cardiomyopathy or something a bit more um, end stage where they really are going to end up in the transplant pathway or maybe not even, then we need to manage those expectations with the parents so that they know um, what is going to come down the pipeline and they're not going to have any um, surprises at the end of the day. And I think I just got kicked out of my talk. No, you're there. Okay. Louisa, I'm showing my slides, so yeah, I, I'm on your slides. It's okay. You can keep talking. Oh, okay. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm on your um, discharge sheet. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, this is a part of what uh, the what we, pr we have as our tools in order to help these parents uh, when they go home so that it's not a very overwhelming experience. Um, we have this, this is formula teaching for the parents. Uh, as you can see, it's individualized to each formula and to each concentration that we recommend for the parents. This is, these are patients that often need higher caloric intake than most of the, than most of the other uh babies that are in it so then the cans of formula don't come with those instructions so it's something that we take for granted of okay well feed the baby as much as you can well we've had plenty of instances when we've sent kids home with okay um 
mixing instructions that are different from the ones that are in the can, and they don't understand how they are. So they come in with dehydration or in kidney failure because uh, the, they were giving too much. So this has been very useful for us in terms of very specific and very step-by-step uh, -step instructions for the babies, especially, to go home with when they need higher um, caloric intake. I did not include it in the conversation in, in the presentation, but we also have all kinds of uh, nutritional recommendations that we give older kids, both like childhood age and teenagers. Um, and that's why it's important to include maybe a nutritionist in your multidisciplinary team. It's important to hook up these patients when they go out to the community with good follow up in terms of weight gain, regular weights, uh, support up with people that are in this multidisciplinary team that can help them um, manage those expectations better and manage what they're going to feed their child a little bit better. And if you can go to the next one. And then because of the polypharmacy aspect that we had, I've included here a calendar that we, that, that we tend to use for our patients. It's in Spanish, since we in Miami have quite a large uh, Spanish-speaking population, then we have them both, we create them both in English and Spanish. But really, it's to simplify the life of the parents and to make sure that they keep track of all these medications that they give, need to give their child. We include both the milligrams of what, how much they need to give, and if you see where it says doses in the third column, the actual CCs of that correspond to that dosage in milligrams. I don't know how many of you have gotten uh, histories from the parents and they don't know how many milligrams they have. They just say, oh, well, I give 0.2 CCs. And so, well, what is 0.2 CCs, especially if a medication has different concentrations? So this is a very useful tool that we have for our parents when they're ready, getting ready to go home. In addition to that, we include what does each medication do and what is it for? So as you can see in the first line, we have aspirin, and then it's for anticoagulation. And if it's a baby, in case this was the, the calendar of a baby, well, you're going to need just a quarter of a tablet, and you're going to mash it and mix it with some water, and then at what time of the day they are supposed to give it. So it helps to keep the family on track, and this helps to organize their life, because once you start adding three, four, five, six medications, it can be quite overwhelming, especially with a newborn baby or, or a child or a new diagnosis, and these are the parents that are needing to absorb a lot of information, and their life really has just been changed quite dramatically. implications as I said before trying to maintain a functional level for these kids is is really of utmost importance multiple medications like I've said it several times they are going to have frequent hospital and doctor visits so this is our these are the patients that are going to get very wary of us as medical providers just from being admitted over and over and poked and prodded and having tubes coming out of their, of their body on over and over so Maintaining the normalcy of this child, I think, is very important. Um, helping them cope, including maybe psychologists, um, trying to make life as normal as possible for them. If there's any arrhythmias that are underlying, the, the quicker we can control them, the better, because they will worsen the situation of the, of the, or the heart failure symptoms. So we definitely want to make sure that at any sign of arrhythmias, we, take close, we pay close attention to that and we address it as soon as possible. If they have, they're in any advanced cardiac therapies, Dr. Davis went through it at length, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But these are all very overwhelming or can be very overwhelming for the family, especially if there's really not if they're not really used as a bridge to any other therapy. So manage the expectations. How long are they going to be on that? Is this a some a bridge to a heart? Or really is this going to be the end therapy? And if so, is that really what they want for not just the patient, but the family as a unity? And then if needed, include or build a heart or if you have available a heart failure or palliative care teams, make use of them for your patients. Involve the nutritionist, the therapist, a psychologist, social worker, case manager, and even pastoral care. All of those, I think we don't think of it so much from the treatment standpoint, but they are very, very important parts of the care that we provide to these kids, especially in the long term. 
and that's my part. And again, I want to apologize profusely for all my technical difficulties. It's been a rough day. So I want to really, really apologize for that. Thank oh. you. It was wonderful. It really oh, was. Louisa, it was fantastic. It was very good. <laughs> very, very good. Okay. Um, so I was wondering if anybody had any particular questions for Louisa. I, was, I know, I'm sure you'll be willing to share your documents with the members of the heart care team if they wanted to adopt Absolutely. the formula or the, um, the medication forms you have, which are very useful, simple. Absolutely. If anybody has any questions, especially like uh, anybody that is abroad, a cualquier persona que esté en el exterior o en cualquier otra parte, si están interesados en tener acceso a alguno de esos, de esos documentos, con muchísimo gusto yo se los puedo compartir. Sorry, I jumped into Spanish. Um, eh, pero sí, de veras, cualquier cosa que, los que, cualquier recurso que les podamos compartir, yo estaré totalmente a su disposición. Well, these We can were... also... Oh, pardon. Go ahead. Who was it? Wait. So anyway, we will be posting this um this uh, this, like, this whole um seminar on our website, and you can always reach out to me or to um, Margaret, and of course Louisa, and we will get you anything that you need. I just wanted to say, Betsy, if I could inter interrupt yes. and interject for just a moment. The, these were really two absolutely first-rate lectures, Louisa and Ryan. Thank you so very much. I learned a tremendous amount from both of you. And I, um, I think that it was a really nice juxtaposition of talks that Daphne put together because the overwhelming majority of heart failure is managed medically. And we have to, all of us have to just get so much better at managing these patients medically and trying to avoid uh, what Ryan and I have the distinct pleasure of doing, me and adults and he and kids, is, is managing these situations at the end stages. And Ryan does an extraordinarily good job at doing that. But the medical management of these patients is changing, it's evolving, and it's getting so much better. So I just wanted to interject and say how, um, how pleased I am to hear both of you speak and how much I learned from both of you. Thank you very much. And thank everyone for joining. It was a great evening. We're a little past our time. I know everybody has things to do. I have a, hope everybody has a wonderful evening. We are planning another one of these sessions. Is it in November or December because of the holiday? Our next one is November 18th, and we will present a Troncus case from our Chiapas September 2019 trip. The two okay. surgeons and nurse practitioner who are on the case will do that. Nice. Thank you so much. Luisa, it was wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Davis, it was great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks. You. Thank you for having us. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Gracias a ustedes. Adios. All right. Yes.